So I, I really like these meetings because, uh, and I'm in particularly interested in the butterfly effect here, because what could we do with this group of people here if we really put our minds to it? And that to me is interesting about humanity and being human at this point in time. The other stuff, thank you Lisa, thank you Paul, we already know that it is really not good. So now what? Uh, and we have few students here in the, uh, in the audience and we have to help the younger people to put the pieces together and make the point quickly and convincingly. And that is what I'm going to try to do today. Navigating paradoxes, nothing is easy here. And so uh, I want to leave you, just in case I run out of time, it sounds like I'm already running out of time. Two points, ecosystem services as an organizing principle, and I was going to talk a little bit about the history of how that came about. And the other part of it, a nature's trust to govern the commons, and that picks up nicely on what Charles was saying, I think. Um, I am an ecological economist. That is an oxymoron in itself. Um, and we have a normative goal of sustainable development. Um, and uh, actually, I do want to tell a little story, and it's going to come out of this, but that's okay. Little story here. I grew up in a concrete forest uh, in Rotterdam, under the smokestacks of the um, the Royal Dutch Society, uh, the, the Royal Dutch Shell, right? Sometimes uh, in the 70s, early 70s, the air was so bad you couldn't go outside. Yeah, that's where I grew up. The bright light was when you turned on the TV, there was Jacques Cousteau with his underworld, what, underwater world. Yes, as a five-year-old, that became my hero. He was my hero. So as we could not be outside, bad air. That was my hero. No surprise, I became. I started, you know, studied marine uh, marine uh, steering environmental sciences later in life. Funny thing is, I met Jacques Cousteau. I was 27. I meet him here at UNESCO. There was my childhood hero, right? And he asked me, so what are you interested in? And I said, ah, sustainable development. And he goes, oh, sustainable development. Uh, enfin, that doesn't exist. Uh, okay, so within 10 seconds, I was in a fight with my childhood hero. The thing is, he was right. Because the big question is, what is it that we're trying to sustain? Yeah? And so it's all about what is it that we're trying to sustain. In this case, as an ecological economist, ecologically sustainable scale is what we worry about. Social fairness of distribution, don't worry, that is a New Zealand joke. Economically efficient allocation, we are now in a space where we call it uneconomic growth. Our costs are much higher than our, uh, than our benefits, and a lot of the benefits we don't even know. And that's what ecosystem services will be about. Ecological economists think about four capitals. We use the capital terminology to get into the listening of, um, of the market-oriented people. And that's the main reason. Really, it's about ecosystems and how they function, human capital, our health, our education, our ability to solve complex issues, social capital, our norms, how do we interact with each other on local and on global level, level. build capital, infrastructure, anything that we measure these days in GDP. Very limited. GDP, just economic activity. It does not measure well-being. Yes? So those are our four capitals. Here's the globe, there's New Zealand. Our side of the oceans, obviously, uh, our side of the globe has a lot of ocean, yes. And ecosystem services to me is an organizing principle that ties together the human subsystem within that big natural capital. Yes, it's a subsystem, there's limited substitutability. Um, ecosystem services then, this uh, particular uh, image, is, uh, it's basically categorization. Um, of, of, um, of things that are important, that services that we get from, uh, from nature. This particular one was, uh, or was built with a, a Maori, um, for, for with a Maori community, a Maori project. First of all, the, um, the cultural services, inspirational research, uh, spiritual education, then the provisioning services, water, um, medicine, genetics, food, and so on, and then 
the regulating services, pollination, uh, gas regulations, erosion control. Uh, and if you look at the literature, they're fairly stable if you look at all of the projects that are being done. Uh, Lisa mentioned a few as well. Give or take a little bit, if you take uh, Charles's uh, laws of power, or power of law, yes, then there is an organization to this. There is a, an, an element of it that, that sort of appears quite often, and there's the supporting services. So I use this concept, this, this categorization, across the land and seascapes. So the same types of categories you can apply across all those landscapes. Um, and that's important because that's a way to get dialogues going, to, ma to show to people that actually we're talking about the same thing, even though it happens in different corners of the world. The other th nice thing, I think, about ecosystem services is that gives you a way to talk about um, uh, across the intensity of use and, and help with making trade-offs. So the provisioning services, they uh, kind of go up as we start to use the environment a bit. Regulating services start to go down fairly quickly. Um, culture, as in recreation, goes up for a little bit. We put some play toys in the environment and we get some more services off of them. Culturally, it goes down fairly quickly. Ask our indigenous friends. Um, but there is a way to think about total ecosystem services and, what's, and that this helps when we do spatial planning, including marine spatial planning. Um, this is also an organizing principle that can help connect the very local to the very global, because there are patterns here. These ecosystem services appear at a very local level, regional, national, all the way to, to global level. And there are ways to put them together and put them on the same map. Why are we doing that? In order to stimulate the right type of dialogues. We need consortia. We need people, groups, networks to come together and say, actually, we're looking at the same thing here. Let's work together and get something done. Yeah? Recently put together uh, foresters and fishermen. Why? Because foresters are really good at planting forests on steep hills, and thereby making sure that erosion and, and soil stays where it should stay and doesn't mess up the power industry on the coast. Yeah? So they've got something in common here if you want to look at the service of erosion control. Um, this is a paper that I did investing in natural capital and getting returns. <coughs> the idea is here to um, think about private assets and very quickly, that's, that's about money, you know, the financial capital cycles with those private assets. But what happens if you would take some of that money and invest that in, say, a forest and to make sure that erosion stays, well, soil stays up the hills and not in the rivers? Or if we give some land back to, um, to wetlands, which acts as sponges, in a case of, of, of storm, then part of that actually comes back to your farm right away. Uh, and we, we, have, we can put numbers on those things. Part of it is nice for the public. Other people then live on your farm. You could come up with ways to reimburse those or, or, or do a wealth transfer for, for at least a while for that service yeah, until we've sorted this out. So, all right. If you look at how farms operate, they, they operate on a daily, seasonal, yearly basis when it comes to uh, 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 yeah, their time scale. But those other systems can go much longer. Times to plant forests, for example, uh, that takes a while. Now, if we, if we look at, an, if you ask an economist or a bank, and, and we talk about interest rates and payback periods, those operate on the fairly high discount rates here. This is about risk, this is about when do you want your money back. If you want it back very quickly, your discount rate is fairly high. Yes? But if we want to do this, this public-private public um, dialogue, then we have to start thinking about a different way of, of, of incorporating discount rates and interest rates. And, and that is a huge topic. Whole projects fall or, or 
topple based on, on this one issue of, of discount rates. Investment traps then, that's another thing we do. We do a lot of systems thinking, um, connecting the dots. Uh, this is an interesting one, but you see investment traps almost anywhere. So uh, what do we do? We do river protection here, of river management. We build stop banks uh, because we want to prevent floods. Now, if we're really good at that, we build houses behind those stop banks or assets. Those assets pay taxes. With the taxes, we build higher and higher stop banks. So we set up a bit of an investment trap. We keep doing it. We can't get, really get out of it. At what point do you stop protecting your assets? Right? So the other question, and with a little bit of a time lag, if you plan it well, you can start investing in natural capital that give you the same service as your stop bank does. Storm protection. And if you can show and, and demonstrate that, you can start planning in a completely different way. So... Very, very quickly then. Um, I got involved in the whole ecosystem services business uh, that really took off with this paper in Nature um, that was about um, uh, the, the global value of ecosystem services. You probably have heard of it. It's probably the most cited paper in the last 10 years in environmental science at this point. Uh, that was a conversation starter. That does not mean that we now figured out what the price of the globe was. It really was a conversation starter. The other thing that we did was put those values of those ecosystems on a spatial map. That hadn't really been done before. So, a little bit later then, 2005, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. Uh, 1,800 or so scientists put their heads together and said, okay, we've got natural capital and their ecosystem services here. Uh, those are the classic uh, categories. And on the other hand, human well-being. Now, over time, the emphasis went on this, figuring out those ecosystems and ecosystem services. Natural scientists love this. Well, not everybody, but they love it because suddenly their, um, their science has a policy context. Very easy, you can sort of expand what you're doing and show that what you're doing actually has value. This side, much harder and hasn't really come in until now. So implementation then. The economics of ecosystems and biodiversity, TEEP, came online and said, okay, how are we going to implement this whole concept? And they, so we do it through a process of identifying, estimating values, capturing values and so on. So what happened was, Hundreds of projects got launched, small-scale projects to demonstrate trade-offs in particular situations. So, a great organizing concept, but we applied it on a project basis. We fragmented it. The accountants got a hold of this. United Nations System for Environment and Economic Accounting uses this ecosystem services approach. Uh, very much looking at the biophysical st uh, structures, how does it function? What do we get from it? The benefits and then that value. That value is the hard part because we talk about non-market value as well as market values, but in the end, it's really about the dollar. And that is uh, where the concept is at risk again. It's a great organizing principle. It could really work for all kinds of purposes, but get the economists involved and it goes right back to that dollar. Yes, so be very wary. Any economist here? Yeah, no? yeah good. Be careful of him. <laughs> so economists are great as long as you can keep them in the box. They're really good at cost benefit in a short term contained perspective. Don't let them get out of the box. Uh, IPBES, I'm part of two this intergovernmental platform for biodiversity ecosystem services. It's the follow up of IPCC and this other TEEP work. Um, I'm on two committees, values and valuations, which is all about worldviews, how do we look at the world, and I'm on modeling and scenarios. And that <laughs> is also a funny one because there are two types of modelers. They're the ones that do statistical models and they're the ones that look at, at systems where you cannot predict things very much. So there is a tension between that. I want to highlight the Ecosystem Services Partnership. 
Um, again, lots of practitioners, all the way from psychologists to lawyers to sociologists, you'll find them in that uh, partnership because everybody can play with this. So I wanted to, um, because this was about transdisciplinary research, was the idea. Five Shades of Disciplinary Grey. Um, Matt Ridley has a great TED talk about uh, ideas have sex. It's beautiful. It's all about the creativity of putting together unlike-minded people and, and then what happens. So you, I really recommend it. When we do this um, work with different disciplines, it's really important to understand what it is we're doing. Uh, multidisciplinary, cross-disciplinary, really that is about mathematicians saying something about music uh, or recognizing patterns in a completely different field. Interdisciplinary, that's when, for example, the sociologists and their different brands start coming together. Interdisciplinary is the best known, of course. That's where natural and social sciences start to um, put things together. Transdisciplinary, something completely different. That's where you accept that as you look at something from a completely different um, uh, uh, angle, the object that you're looking at itself is starting to change. In order to put these teams together, transdisciplinary teams, you need different type of people. And that's really, really important. We tend to take an expert and then <laughs> expand a little bit. But really you need an interpreter who understands what the context in which the research is needing to be useful. You need the experts, and I'm saying those are our disciplinaries. You need the modelers who can put things together and make things visible. You need the communicator who can really repeat over and over and over the research that, that, that you've just done. And you need the integrator, and I'm saying the guardian, kind of the, uh, the conscious of your, of your team. Um, all right, now I'm really running out of time. Um, I'm all into this <laughs> system of systems. I better get. S I better stop then. Eh? Um, this is about connecting small data and big data, and a process of of how to do that. I was going to talk a little bit about property rights, as we have private and and public property rights. We now need common property rights, um, and that was going to move toward the idea of a common asset trust, and this was how it's going to be coming together. Um, ecosystem services from natural capital. Yes, we do need, do need to set hard ecological uh, limits in order to maintain that, uh, that scale. There's all kinds of ways to efficiently allocate already. Um, if we do that well, we could create a nature's trust um, administered by the guardians for all beneficiaries. It's kind of the uh, the idea, who then have the means, hopefully, to uh, to invest back into it. This was the slide that I looked at um, that I showed yesterday. There are examples of this already. We do give legal rights to uh, rivers. Uh, there are calls for atmospheric trust. This is a good book uh, by uh, by a, a lawyer who takes issue with law and how it's done and comes to the same conclusion. Marine protected areas have been talked about already. Why not scale it up and create an ocean's trust? And so that is where I'm going to leave it. And sorry, it was... Yeah. So this is for Charles. What do you think the ethical issue is now when somebody like Bill Gates wants to go to Africa to reduce malaria, increase life expectancy, and other areas of poverty. I mean, you're talking about reducing now death rate. And so that inevitably will have a consequence on an increase in population. Is, so what's, I mean, there's a trade-off here that's an ethical issue, and I just, I know you must have thought about this at some point. I have thought about it, and it is extremely, uncomfortable thinking, mostly because of the time lag. But if you look at what happens when you reduce the death rates, in Victorian England 150 years ago, people had, my grandparents were one of 6, 8, 10, 15 children. You have a lot of children in the hope that a couple will survive to look after you in old age. In every country so far, I think, 
um, the surviving birth rate has gone down. There are some westernized countries where populations are actually declining. So I don't think it is inevitable, as, as you say. And the evidence of countries so far is um, that the numbers come down. If you don't need to have 15 children, I mean, hands up all the women in here who would like to have 15 children. No, not very many. How many here who are students aged 20 who will already have had five children, like I've seen in Madagascar? It wouldn't have helped your studies, would it? I mean, it, it doesn't actually happen like that because of how human behavior happens. But this is fingers crossed stuff. Remember, fingers crossed, uh, keeping our fingers crossed is how we manage the planet at the moment. It's not a very good way, is it? Maybe a question for, for Marianne. So how would you see a, uh, a nature trust uh, in an ocean context? Um, do you see uh, a common ownership of a, of a coral reef or a, or a patch of ocean or...? I, I see it first as, as one ocean and it's first of all about the context, the, 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 the concept of an ocean's trust. That in itself is a paradigm shift. It, has, it picks a little bit up on, you know, nature is functioning fine as it is. Really what we should be doing is managing ourselves and our own impact better. Yeah? And just to recognize it as a system, not one that needs to be managed, but one that has rights in itself, is a, a very good starting point to bounce off how far you can go. And it's, it's a dialogue that's now playing out in, in New Zealand uh, around a river and, and in Vermont around a river. Um, it is a different starting point. It's a paradigm shift to begin with. And it allows for people to have a completely different voice other than what do you think is possible right now. It's about what do we think is really needed right now. All the things we're talking about here suddenly get a voice and a place and, an, and space. Yeah. I wanted to ask a question to Paul. I was trying to understand um, what was the implication, if you would translate what you said, your presentation, in, in a challenge or in a political question. What must we avoid? Must, what must we do? Must we have, a, um, for instance, an international convention on geoengineering? Because finally... Geoengineering is a catchword for many possibilities for removing carbon dioxide or altering planetary albedo. Those are two different things. And for example, removing carbon dioxide is a, a very desirable thing to do. It can be done, technically, from stack gases. So if you did it first at sources, uh, this is not really a technical challenge. It's just a cost. So the very first thing, which I think everybody agrees to in principle, but nobody agrees to in practice, is a tax on carbon. We have to have some cost. You cannot use the air shed, the atmosphere, as a free dumping ground for your emissions. It's just, it's just ridiculous. So the United States will not agree to that. COP21 is doomed because unless the United States agrees to it, I don't think the second largest producer of carbon dioxide in the world should go scot-free. But that's the fact at the moment. Politically, it's a doomed problem because we're going into an election cycle, but that's what I would say, uh, tax. So that's number one. Number two, then, can you remove it from the atmosphere? Yes, but the cost is high. So. If you remove it from stack gases, the cost is lower because it's much more concentrated. It's $35 to $50 a ton. Once you put it in the atmosphere, it's about $100 a ton. And very much more energy intensive, by the way. Now, if you can do a mix of both of those things over the next 30 years, and let me just point out to you, I mean, it's just amazing to me how long it takes nations to do things when they don't want to, and how quickly they can do things when they want to. So let's just think about this way. Uh, my father was born in 1901 in a small town in Pennsylvania, was a coal miner. So uh, in 1901, coal was used as a major source of electricity for the world. It's still the major source of electricity for the world. So we haven't changed a damn thing in terms of generating electricity from a source of fuel, which is one of the most polluting sources of fuel on the planet. However, in the intervening time, we've invented 
airplanes that can fly across entire oceans nonstop. We've invented cell phones. We've invented computers. We've invented whole bunches of drugs. We've done many, many, many things. We just haven't transformed the energy sector. So the joke in the United States is, if Alexander Graham Bell woke up today and he walked in to a telephone company, he wouldn't have the vaguest idea how the system worked anymore. Whereas Thomas Edison, if he woke up and came back and he walked into an electric power plant, it would be exactly more or less the way he designed it, you know, Tesla. Well, yeah, Tesla did this. But so, that, so the issue is here that we have not transformed the energy sector like we have done for very many other things. We technically have the know-how, it's a political will and a market issue. And so that's, that's where I would put my money. I don't ever want to see, and I, I, it's scary to me, I don't ever want to see where we're injecting particles into the stratosphere to remove uh, sunlight from hitting the planet. Because once you go down that road, let me just give you a very quick example of this. You have two, two issues here. You're either taking out the garbage and disposing of it, or you're putting perfume on it. So if you're putting perfume on it, you're not altering the fact that you're putting garbage out in your backyard. It's just rotting. Once you go down this road, once you go down this road, you have to do it forever. I mean, for hundreds and hundreds of years. You cannot stop. If you stop, and you've built up five, six, seven hundred, eight hundred, nine hundred, a thousand, one thousand, five hundred ppm CO2, you stop injecting sulfate, it's an immediate climate shift that is traumatic. I mean, you will, within a decade, you will have, you will have major loss, major, major loss of habitat and life. Say that to Mr. Crutzen. Mr. Crutzen knows this. Um, it's, yes, Mr. Paul knows that.